All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery, and we are back in the studio today with some special guests. Uh, Ian, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm a guest now. <laughs> uh, he's been in and out of the studio with uh, health issues with his dad. We're we're hoping for the best with him. Looks like he's still surviving uh, the long haul. He's hanging in there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, actually, a uh, little improvement. So that's good. awesome. Yeah. Uh, we are joined today by a longtime off-road enthusiast that a lot of you might know if you've been um, lurking in the YouTubes or at the events throughout the year. Uh, we have uh, Brandon Twitchell from HCR. Welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, guys? Good to be here. Um, so we've met online a few times, but in person for the first time last year at UTV Takeover Utah, um, and you were kind enough to hook me up with my favorite new hat, um, black <laughs> on gray is my thing, and... Um, Suck up! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, you uh, are working with uh, HDR and a whole bunch of um, brands associated with the parent company. Um, kind of give us you uh, a lowdown on who you are, what you're doing, where you're at, and uh, let's get into it. Yeah, guys. So my name is Brandon Twitchell. I'm uh, pretty much a Utah boy my whole life. We're down here in Southern Utah, about 45 minutes from San Hollow. So most, a lot of people are familiar with San Hollow now. That's our background or that's our backyard. So we're uh, very fortunate to have that as our proving grounds and, and have a lot of fun out there for sure. It was quite an experience having UTV Takeover come to San Hollow this year because we've never had an event like that in Utah, especially San Hollow. And it was, it was a wild time, man. We had a, we had a good time and a lot of new people, you know, a lot of new faces. There was actually three events within a month of each other. Right. You guys had Trail Hero out there. And... Yeah, Trail Hero. And then we actually sponsor uh, the Side-by-Side Adventure Rally as well. And they all have their own group of people. So it, it, it turned out really well. I was, I was kind of skeptical at first when I heard they were all back-to-back, but you know, the different crowds that they all, they all drew different crowds and was a very successful year. So I was, I was stoked on it. Well, I'm blown away that you said that, uh, they haven't had an event like that down there before. Cause that's the most amazing place in the world. It's to- <laughs> taken over as my favorite place to ride. It really has. You know, I mean, if you're going to go to a general area, you know what we do. I mean, we, we traverse States. I mean, that's not a park. That's not an area. That's not right. BLM land. Um, San hollow. It's un- it's unreal. It's a flat out. Yeah, man, it's, it's a good time for sure. It's a lot of fun because you have, obviously if you're a rock crawler, there's really, it's, it's some of the best rock crawling out there and it, it doesn't tear your stuff up like a lot of bouldery type uh, rock crawling does, but you can still re- get pretty wild on it. But then when you're out, you know, you, you've been on the trail for, you've covered it uh, one mile in a day and then you can get hit the dunes on the way back to the truck and haul butt. It's, it's a good time. It's a lot of fun. And, and the, the scenery doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah. wheeling yeah, in the grand canyon <laughs> yeah i mean we've yeah. talked before about the sand out there how unique that is and and the rock formations and just how every turn you take you have a new lookout to look out on and yeah epic area so give us a little background on uh who you are and, and how you grew up in the off-road industry and and where you come from because you know nowadays everyone's kind of connected you and hcr and, and utv and and all this but you have a, a different background in, in trucking right in, in jeep yeah yeah, I've kind of done a little bit of everything. You know, through a typical off-road guy, I grew up on uh, more farm-type stuff, utility four-wheelers and different things. When we moved from northern Utah to southern Utah, I was in high school, roughly, and started riding dirt bikes, got into motocross, you know, typical typical deal there. Did, did that for several years. Um, I took a break from it and actually built a little 5 1600 Volkswagen. Tried a little <laughs> nice. bit of desert racing. I found out that got expensive quick when we <laughs> nearly broke the car in half and lost the motor and everything else. And so that kind of ended that little run for a minute. Um, I was actually, a, I've, I've been a, was an appliance salesman of all things for about 15 years. And that supplied my off-road habits, I guess you would say. Um, about when was it? It would have been like 2009-ish. I met Damon, the old owner of HCR, they had just moved to Utah from California and, uh, we hit it off and hung out and he let me take some of his demos out. And, you know, at the time I just came out of the Volkswagens and thought these things were pretty cool. And, um, you know, we came, we stayed in touch throughout the year and later on, I can't, 
gosh, I can't think of what year it would have been, like probably 2013, I want to say. He finally hit me up and like, hey, man, we, we have a shipping op, a shipping position open. Um, you basically have to fill like eight jobs for me to justify paying you to come to work <laughs> for me. But I was so eager to get out of what I was doing and actually take a job that I want, you know, had, had my passion with. So I, I went for it. And we did, I did that for, gosh, it was probably about three years and had a great time. They took really good care of me. And, you know, I was looking at starting my family and different things. And I actually got a job offer at Dixie Four Wheel Drive down in St. George. And, and it was too good to pass up, you know, as hard as it was to leave HDR, I, I had to give it a shot. And so I went down there it was for about a year and a half or two years, uh, met a lot of really cool people. I was always kind of, a, I was doing Jeep stuff on the side also, it, you know, rock crawling, different things, just because it's so popular in our area. And uh, I did that for, for that while. The, the different clientele, you know, really high-end Jeep builds, $100,000 Jeeps. And a super professional shop and and so on and it that got seems to, to be the story with all jeeps is they start at fifty thousand yeah. and they end up at a hundred thousand <laughs> yeah side by sides are no different anymore <laughs> right um but yeah we did that for a bit had a really really good time with that made a lot of good friends and a lot of good people but we finally decided that me and my wife did not want to move to st george i was commuting back and forth every day and decided it was best to stay in Cedar city. She's, she's actually a nurse here in Cedar city and she has been since high school. So she's got a, a lot, a lot of, um, well, hometown feeling there as far as that goes. So I actually hit up Damon. I was back in town one day and just asked him to go to lunch, you know, which hadn't talked to him in a while. And the first thing he asked me before he even said yes to go to lunch, he's like, why do you want a job back? <laughs> and and believe it or not, we, you know, we went to lunch and we figured out a way to make it work. And I came back and just went strictly into sales. They had already, you know, had shipping and stuff figured out at that point. So fortunately I got to focus just on sales. I came back and really kind of hit the road, traveled to dealers, different things. And, uh, that led us basically up to what well, it would have been in September of 2018 is when Daystar products acquired HDR. Um, I'd actually fiddled around with buying the company myself and couldn't quite beat them to the punch, unfortunately. Right. And it, I've been actually really glad how it all worked out. But at that point, Damon basically left the company. I have, you know, took over since then and we've, we've hit the ground running ever since. It's been quite the ride. I think September of 18 is when I met you at Sandsport. Yeah, that probably would have yeah. been right. Yep. So, so what's your official title now as far as uh, HCR goes? So let's see. It would have been almost a year ago. To, yeah, this month we we got a new CEO, and he split our corporation into two divisions: into a light truck division and power sports. So power sports is is HCR, uh, HGT power sports, and then we have Voodoo off road as well. So recovery ropes, recovery gear, a lot of good stuff. So that's under the power sports line up right now and then as future goes on you know we're we're looking at acquiring more companies and they'll all fund fall under the power sports division they got my hands full yeah they, fun, there's it's cool. like uh, there's been a massive ascent on utv over the last probably 18 months you know with COVID and stuff we've seen a lot of new enthusiasts come in i was stoked to see you guys get in you know working with hct you know, I mean, if you if you don't date back to like 27, 2018, you know, there was a little gap there where, you know, some other power adder companies were able to kind of penetrate the market. HCT has been around for a while and kicking butt. They have, they have. And we've actually kind of changed the business model, believe it or not. The HCT was, you know, it was knowing as, as hardcore tuning. And since we've moved it to Utah, we don't have the facility for the tuning anymore. So we're, we're actually kind of getting out of that game, believe it or not, and focusing more on uh, direct consumer web sales, e-commerce, and make it any, more of a, a power sports superstore is, is kind of the model behind the business now. 
And that makes sense with the way the market's shifted, right? Like the tuning is there, but there's a whole lot more competition there. And there's a lot to be won over when you can supply a large set of products versus very short, small amounts of products. Um, and with how the, how the market's growing, right? Like having more options for accessories and, and upgrades and suspension and all this other stuff. Uh, it makes sense to have a pivot like that happen, um, you know, around this time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And we're not, I'm not a tuner. I'm not an engine guy or anything else. I'm not going to pretend that I am. So why would we, why would we try and do that? I would rather work with some other companies that know what they're doing and that's what they do and, you know, help, help promote those brands and, and work off of that. So give us a little backstory on HCR, uh, as far back as you are integrated, right? Like as far as, uh, how that kind of company started as far as how it picked its first product sets and where it where it, its first big hit was and and kind of how it's grown over the years yeah sure so so the original owner was damon cardone he was a super cool dude we're still great friends these this day and then his daughter Brittany cardone they you know they really took this company and made it into what it was and and handed us a really great tool to work off of when i met him back in 09 you know the the razor 800 you had the Kawasaki and the Yamaha and then the Canon Commander. Those are, those are the four the four big lineups. And he had one of each and he was nice enough to let me take them out and go running around for whatever reason. I had the worst luck. I think I had a wheel fall off the Rhino. Uh, <laughs> well, it, anyways, I should have checked nut and bolted them before I went out. But, well, I'm sure uh, they, weren't, they weren't easy on him before you had it. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But he actually started HCR as RC car parts. So really? way back in the, the tracks, like the T-Max days, the big monster truck type deals, they made titanium A-arms and frames and really cool trick stuff until the, you know, the aftermarkets came over and just took, a, took it all over. Right. And he got so bummed out about that. He's like, heck with this. I'm going to, I'm going to try the side-by-side thing. And they developed the long travel kit for the Rhino and, kind of evolved from there. So you mentioned you guys are doing light truck stuff. Like, uh, can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So the, the corporation obviously we're owned by is we've got uh, Daystar, Tough Country, RevTech, um, Performance Accessories, which is body lifts, a little bit of everything. They, so, you know, they're, they're, I really don't have a lot involved on that side of things. You know, we're all a big team and we all strive to work together, but that's kind of why they split us up to help us focus on what we're good at and, and go from there. So Tough Country is actually up in Salt Lake City, so not far from us. So uh, most everything's all kind of ran through that point. And then Daystar is down in Phoenix, Arizona, and that's our corporate headquarters. That's cool. So um, you guys or HDR started making these long travel kits and then the razor came around, right? Like it kind of revolutionized the side-by-side industry um, in that 2014, 2015 timeframe. Uh, what was kind of the transition for the company at that point? Was it like, um, you know, we were, we've only been operating a certain level. Now we're going all in, or was it like we saw this coming and now we're going to dominate this kind of game? No, they're, they're kind of all in before. And, you know, they, they went, they made it through the, the economy crash where, where we all saw. And once the, the XP 1000 came out, that's actually where I took a break from Jeeps. And I actually traded that my Jeep at the time for a brand new XP 1000. A kid had bought it and I think he got in over his head and right. decided he needed a Jeep. So I traded it for an XP 1000. That's how me and Damon actually got talking again is he needed a, to mock up a roof, an aluminum roof for it. And once that came around, we all realized the potential of them and how fun they were. And it, it just blew up from there, man. It was, it was a wild ride from, from the get go. So what would be one of the pivotal moments for, you know, the industry and how you guys incorporate with the suspension, like between that point and now, what were kind of some of the big points for you guys to say that, you know, wow, this is really becoming such a huge market. Well, what I think how HCR itself capitalized on it was the fact that these vehicles, you know, you can put long travel on them. You know, they, they were getting better and better, but we found out how much better you can make them by widening them out. Right. In the earlier days, you know, people would give us a hard time because our arms are so hard or so heavy and, and different things. But Damon did a lot of work, which is pretty cool in, in changing the shock geometry and adding a longer shock with a shock tower to correct the motion ratio. 
and sticking the, the lower shock mount out towards the ball joint so you don't have as much leverage and it makes you stronger. And he really, you know, built off that model and really was stuck to his guns. You know, when, when I came around and had some different ideas, like, nope, this is what works. We're not changing anything. This is the way it is. And uh, that's the way we rolled. And that's the way we sold it. And the, the problem I've seen, you know, working with him throughout the years is that limited us to a very small uh, portion of people and, and the, of the market. You know, there's not a lot of people that's going to spend $8,000 eight, nine, ten thousand dollars on a suspension kit that they on top of feel a, like is already twenty five thousand dollar machine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, from I, I was it was really cool because I got to learn a lot of the good and bad, I guess you would say, working for Damon. So when I finally got the opportunity to take things over and and kind of open my eyes and see the the spots we we're missing, we started developing uh mid travel kits that use stock shocks you know, stock lane shocks. And, and I'm not going to lie, they're, they're not as good. You know, there's, there's no if, ands, or buts about it that using a stock shock and adding all this leverage, you know, it, it add, you know, you've got to do big springs. You've got to do all kinds of stuff as Ian knows on his pro feet. <laughs> I was just, I was just about to say, Ian knows all too well what happens yep. to a two inch Walker Evans shock at long travel. Yeah. I'm going to yeah, excuse exactly. myself now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, there's good and bad behind it, but one of the big the big holes we were missing is a lot of the shock tuners didn't want to mess with these custom shocks and custom lengths and custom valving because essentially they're having to start over and it's a lot of work to focus on this one shock that you know there's only 15 guys out there that really they're probably going to get for it. So that's it's a that's lot of time and money and effort to tune a exactly. system like that, especially when you're starting to talk about your individual riding style and environments and and the needs that you have for your shocks. I mean, how many times have, have people said that, you know, your shocks just don't meet muster when they're from the factory? Well, but that's because you're already pushing it past what it was intended to do. And especially if you throw a long travel on, I mean, putting a 62 inch machine or 64 inch machine out to 72 inches is not just a little bit extra work for the shock. It's like a whole different planet that it's having to deal with. Right. Right. Well, and we only offered our long travel kits with King shocks. And as we all know, King is an amazing shock, but there's not a lot of guys out there that like to tune them other than King. Right. You know, it's, it's a very complicated shock and, and really there's not, I've not found a lot of guys that are, are real comfortable with doing them. And, and once again, that was just a hole we saw that we could uh, fulfill and, and do something different. So you guys, you just mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the new mid travel selection of products that you're coming out with um, and, and that you've been working on. Uh, I think it's important that people understand that ACR has been s- synonymous with long travel replacement, right? Like it's, you think long travel, what are your options? Like HCR is usually one of the first two that you mention. Uh, but it's important to know that people also have options for the middle ground. So like, for example, the Razor uh, Turbo that we have, um, you know, working with the terrain that we do and the trail riding we do and all that stuff, a lot of times 72 becomes a limitation. And especially for like East Coast guys or anyone that spends time in the thick of stuff, not just out in the desert, that that mid travel option is a huge win for you. You're getting a wider stance. You can get forward offset. You can get longer trailing arms. You can do all the things that benefit you for your riding characteristics uh, without having to sacrifice the limitations of the trail selection that you have. So um, the mid travel is a is a huge win because you can get wider without doing like a four plus three offset wheel and get and lose your steering capabilities um you can go keep that kind of stock six plus one or or a zero offset wheel and maintain the nimbleness of that while at the same time being wider just not as wide as as these bigger cars yeah exactly one of the fun parts about these days too is i mean take the can-am for example it's already long travel out of the box and there are a few companies that offer a even wider version of it, but in my opinion, I go wider than 72 inches, especially adding some wheels on there. It's just getting too much. You know what I mean? Um, but the be, to being able to provide a product of just a direct OEM replacement that literally you can tell the customer it is bulletproof. Like if you, if you wreck this arm, you have so many more problems than a wrecked arm. You know, that's just <laughs> right. all, all there is to it. And, you know, that's been a huge market and a huge success for us is, is building OEM replacements as well. 
I think that's just a, it's an important understanding that um, the, the value, a lot of people complain about how expensive, you know, suspension upgrades are. And they're expensive because they work. <laughs> they're expensive because of a lot of reasons. The materials that oh, are yeah. going into it, oh, the yeah. thickness of that material, the engineering that goes into that, the um, the the types of welding and the gusseting and the all the things that you don't get from an OEM suspension kit, right? Like the the OEMs are saying this is good enough to pass muster, you know, for for logistical reasons with the government, for for licensing, for rollover tests and 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 handling. But we're going to leave most of this up to the aftermarket, right? That's where you guys excel is that they're, they're leaving the door open for you guys to make these into custom tunable machines. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, suspension upgrades are a lot like divorces. They're expensive, <laughs> because, they're, expensive because they're worth it. <laughs> right. right. So, yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit about what you were saying about that, um, that new, uh, is it called the, the sport line? Yeah, yeah. So the last, what, two or three months, and I've, we've been being pushed, you know, to create something like this for so long. One of my biggest discouragements about going online and reading forums and different things of what people recommend on, on suspension replacements, I see all these people shout out, oh, HCR, HCR. But that person asking says, oh, I'd love to, but I, I can't afford it. It's not in my budget. <clears throat> and I, I see that so much. It's just very frustrating. And I wish we had, I've always wished we had something that you know, I don't want to change what we're making now because it works. You know, we're very proud of what we do and what it is. So we decided we wanted to to branch out and try and simplify the engineering process, simplify the design, and make an affordable kit, basically. So, you know, with the Can-Am being such a popular model, and fortunately for us, a high failure product. <laughs> Ian, do you know anything about that? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we decided to start with that. We started out with a 2021 uh, X3 Smart Shock rig, and um, I believe we went through about three revisions by the time we finally nailed it. So it's basically a, an eighth inch steel kit, nothing really special about the steel itself. It'll all be MIG welded. So, you know, that's one of our the big cost reductions right there, just time alone. And, uh, you know, with the, the beauty of it is, is we know where they fell and how they fell. So, you know, those are the areas we really paid attention to making it out of a, a lighter still. And, uh, man, it's, it's worked great. I've, I've, I've only been able to put about 350 miles on the car, but I can promise you every single one of those miles, I have driven it as hard as I possibly can to my abilities. Uh, in fact, my, my back hurts right now because I've I've kind of jacked it up by driving that car so hard. <laughs> yeah, it, I feel it, I feel that it's it's very proven at this point. You know, if I if anyone gets out there and breaks it at this point, they're it's on them. They screwed up. Yeah, you and I uh, when I first met you, you and I talked a little bit about my YXZ, and uh, yeah, uh, you touched on budget and what's within somebody's budget, what's not, and. I what I've changed is I I got into a car that I love, and how I'm determining what I'm going to spend and where I'm going to put that investment is on how long I'm going to keep the car, and right, I, maybe sure. maybe that works for some people, maybe it doesn't, but like, you know, our our little Pro XP, I I don't think that thing's going anywhere anytime soon. Same with my Can Am, so the budget then almost becomes, uh, it's still a real thing, but it get, it's you, more can, malleable. you can be a little bit more flexible about where your ambitions lie and can kind of progressively chip away. And, yeah. you know, like I said, my X3, I mean, I'll tell you that I'll keep it for three years and then I'll have a pro R this fall, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I don't know. I've been saying but, the same thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, but as it sits right now, the plan is to keep it. But yeah, I mean, I, that's kind of where uh, my decisions have changed is just based on how long I plan on keeping the car. Right. Right. And I think that's, that's important for a lot of people to, to not have a knee jerk reaction on, you know, some of these investments. Like when we get into a side by side, you know, we've, we've already did the big investment, right. And then all of a sudden we're starting to see just how much more of an investment this is going to be long term. Yeah. And cause, cause a lot of us justify the purchase with, well, I'll just keep it for 10 years and, and it'll be good enough. Right. Um, and then you realize that <laughs> you yeah. have about, about two years worth of salary to pay for accessories and upgrades. Sure. Um, sure. 
and, and but it's important that people don't have that knee-jerk reaction, and a lot of that comes from education. Well, it's important that people ride in these cars that have been tuned appropriately as well. Like, uh, you know, the the Pro XP, we stretched it out to 72. It's a totally different car now. Right. You know, just the, the HCR kit that's on there right now, just change the machine top to bottom. It's it's capability, the confidence level you have behind the wheels off the charts. Yeah, and, and a lot of times people will get into a side by side after riding with somebody that's already put in another ten grand worth of upgrades into their car and expect that from the gate going into a brand new machine. Um, and so that's where just you know some of us media type people need to do a better job of educating the community that you know this is what to expect with a brand new car. This is what to expect the night and day difference between the upgrade and making sure that um, you're you're going into this with a full understanding. But I think that's important that you know brands have the middle ground options as well. That's why I'm so excited for the sport line, right? Is that all day long, I can recommend HCR uh, because I know that it's a proven platform and I know that's a proven product. Uh, but at the end of the day, if someone's telling me they don't got the budget for it, you know, ultimately they're going to probably end up with a, a lackluster replacement or just not replacing it in general. And uh, ultimately what's going to end up happening is they're going to throw it into a G out. They're going to throw it into a rut. They're going to throw it into a corner where something you know, ultimately ends up breaking and then they're forced to replace it. Right. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's nice now to have those middle ground options where, okay, we've put this off long enough. Now we can invest at least a little bit of money into the suspension and know that we're going to get the same high quality. We're going to have the same high reliability just at not maybe that premium price point. And, uh, like for, like I was saying that the razor, I think that's going to be the ticket, um, for what that platform is going to look like over the next year yeah. is, is getting that out to that little bit wider platform. Platform, but not full long travel. I, I think if you give it like five to 10 years, Brandon, you mentioned you're from motocross. What's what's the first dollar you spend on a motocross bike? It's suspension. It always is suspension. Right. Yep. I, I think yep. it's going to come where side-by-sides are the same. Uh, for instance, like I took a ride in a Wayland car out at UTV Takeover, and it was a 2020 uh, XRS, so it was a 172 horse. It was a white car, and it's just running that basic stock suspension with the three-click Fox. So I'm in a 250-horsepower car, and I'm going, this thing does not have the suspension for the amount of power it's putting to the ground. Especially you know, when it, your wheel's up. No, I, I legitimately was like, if, if, if you approach the face of a dune too hard, you'll just just blow it up into the fr- into the face you know it just doesn't right. have the ability to take that impact and right. I, i'm like this thing somebody needs to talk to brandon <laughs> <laughs> and i think that goes back to like what's your priority right like if you're a if you're a straight line you know dune racer the horsepower without the suspension is going to make sense if you're mm-hmm. a if you're a an all around driver, you know suspension's a bigger part of that uh, that equation. Um, if you're just a trail rider, you know maybe just wheels and tires are part of the equation. Uh, but it's important to understand the differences and the and the pros and cons of the different components. And suspension is a uniquely positioned part because it improves so many aspects of your ride. Um, if as long as your shocks are set up to handle that improvement uh, and the geometry change, um, and then you're you're not pushing it too far where you have to stiffen the frame up and with with the reinforcements you know you're looking at a completely different game on that car like it's going to handle different it's going to drive different it's going to uh, jump different if you're jumping it's going to pretty much every aspect of that car outside of the seat position is going to be affected by by that travel yeah well and i think you dialed it in saying you know properly tuned suspension you know a lot of people look at hcr and think you know we do shocks we do not do shocks we We've never cracked open a shock since I've been here. We'll throw springs on them to get the ride height proper, but we do not do shocks. We, we focus on building strong suspension. That's, that's what we do. And, and uh, you know, 90% of the time when you see a failure or a broken part, it's because of your shocks are not tuned properly. It's from bottoming out over and over and over, and that eventually breaks stuff. And I don't think people realize that, you know, it's how important that really is. Yeah. Touching on that, like uh, things like limit straps and bump stops. Uh, what's HCR's take on stuff like that? I've talked to a lot of people that think that it should be almost borderline mandatory on every rig. You know, like, I, I, I've, I'm becoming a little bit more of a believer in that just because it's, it's more of a, an annoyance when it comes to limit straps for the tire, the shock banging, you know, when it drops out completely. Or, yeah. 
Well, I think uh, that I also goes back to like people trying to push Walker Evans too far versus a stock or a Fox shock that has that that. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, I think now that we're running, you know, 33, 35 inch tires and different things and getting so much weight out there, that lemon straps becoming a lot more uh, necessary. But ultimately, you know, we build the suspension to where it will work with the geometry of the shock. So, you know, everybody's saying like, oh, you're over traveling the CVs and that's why I'm blowing CVs. In fact, Ian, I think you had that issue on your car at Takeover. Do I, is that right? No, that was a tie rod that wasn't cinched oh, down. Oh, a tie enough. rod. Yep. I was thinking exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. And but anyway, the, the idea behind living straps for most people in their mind is so you don't over travel your CVs and blow your CVs out. And a lot of the times when people get into their shocks, they take limiters out thinking, oh, we're gaining travel or doing this or that, but it's actually overextending CV. You can only, you only have so much travel. It, all your travel is limited by a CV. That's all there is to it. And people don't understand that. You know, when you, when you're building a long travel kit, the first thing they ask, well, how much travel it does that have? It, it's essentially the same amount of travel. You're gaining a little bit by making it wider because your, your, your points are different. But really, you're gaining stability. That's it, right. everything comes down to stability. The travel numbers don't mean anything unless you have a properly tuned shop. Well, and and it's important to understand that like the benefits aren't just in you know in in the shock travel. It's just when your wheel can move more and your shock can move less. Right, it's going to get less hot. It's going to fade out less often. It's going to eat up some of that chatter easier, and so you're going to feel more plush. Uh, and then when you're side hilling or you're getting overextended on on your climbing or your downhill or whatever, you're getting a lot more stable of a and, and more confident in your driving. Um, but but that additional work that it's doing to to feel that way um, directly impacts the shocks first couple stages, right? Like those first stages do a lot more work and those, those further deep stages do uh, for the most part, less work because it's getting eaten up mostly by that first couple stages. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at that, I mean, that's why it's so important to talk about shock tuning, right? Like that's, you're changing geometry, but you're changing ratios more importantly. And exactly. And those ratios uh, can make or break your your ride. And and when we and you're talking about, you know, breaking other components besides, your, you know, your, your travel system, um, you know, you're talking about mounting points. You're talking about the fact that the factory's uh, frame is no longer the strong point. Now the <laughs> suspension's the stronger right. point. Right, so right. you have now weaker points of failure in line. And uh, and then you're talking about limit straps and, and the CV angles and all that. You know, when you go wider and, and all that, you're going to have to take that into consideration. And it, it always comes back to that, the weakest point of failure, right? Like what's going to fail first and, and planning for it and not just throwing long travel on and, and considering it, you know, problem, problem solved. Exactly. Yep. Yep. But so, yeah, back, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're good. Go ahead. Back to this, this sport line. So the whole, the whole goal behind it obviously was to reduce our costs. We, uh, we achieved that by, let's just take the Can MX3 kit because that's the first one out. Our dual sport kit, which is the fully boxed, retails for thirty-seven fifty. This new Sportline kit is going to retail at nineteen ninety-nine. So huge difference. In, and what does in that kit. include? That includes all four A arms and trailing arms. Wow! So just all direct replacement trailing arms, and and uh, you know it's not it's not as low of a price point as some of our competitors, but it's it's a very very good in between, and you know I. I hope to most people they they respect the knowledge that we've gained throughout the years of of how to how to build things and reinforce things and and I, I do I feel really confident in this and the biggest thing you know one of our big concerns was well is this going to take away from our premium brand and what we do now and my my goal is to educate people the difference between the two and really it's just going to come down to price point you know if you're a a full blown racer going out to race King of the Hammers or Work Series or whatever this is not the kit for you. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Will it survive? Probably yes, but it is not as strong as our premium kit. There's no question there. Um, and that's not saying it's weak. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But there is a difference, and and I do want to make that very clear to people. There's a reason it's cheaper, but a lot of that is aesthetics. You know, we we take such pride in our aesthetics. In you know, you take one of our arms after it comes out of production. It's so beautiful. You want to hang it on a wall. 
your but dinner the, kit is just for like jewelry. Right, right. But the cool part about that is we have some of the top drivers in the world out there beating on it, you know, and and it and it surviving races over and over and over again. You know, it's it's pretty cool to say we have the best looking and the strongest. In in my opinion, I, I don't think there's any argument on the the aesthetics part of it. I think you put any put the HDR kit up to most anything in the industry. Well, it's well last week Zach and I were actually talking about some of the uh, the new trend of seeing clear coat long travel HDR oh, yeah. kits, and I was yep. looking at that going, that is just like Mad Max rat rod. You just look at a <laughs> HDR full kit that's like TIG welded and done oh, yeah. correctly, like. I've always said I want to build eventually someday a completely raw build that's clear coated. Like let it let it shine. Let the craftsman work craftsman's work shine through and and show how awesome these things are. Because I mean, it the it's just like a really well seasoned exhaust tip. Like it just looks yeah, so good, yeah. right? And uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's just a huge win to be able to see because you guys offer it in raw and then you have the option to buy it in a powder coat, right? Correct. Yep. And yep. I think there's something something to be said for the ability for a brand to say, you can see the work done here from the factory. We're not going to hide anything. We're not going to grind and paint. We're not going to fill. We're not going to do any of that. And I think how many times have we um, seen situations where, you know, we're getting stuff from the factory with, you know, big globs of, of, um, of welding splatter and and all this other stuff. Um, And, and there's been other companies, other brands that have taken shortcuts to kind of reduce the cost and increase margin in that area. And, and something that I really respect with HCR is that they've simply just said, kind of what you were talking about earlier. No, this is the way we do it. This is the way we're always going to do it. And we're always going to keep our standard at a certain level so that we can never, ever have to debate the, the question of quality and, and, and effort put into these products. Yeah. And what's funny is this new, this new line, it was actually a, a big challenge for us because we're so used to making it over the top and over engineering it and making it as cool as we can possibly think of and trying to simplify our process it was, it was a lot harder than I thought it would be. So what are some of the challenges of going from a TIG uh, like workshop to a MIG workshop? So there's, it's not a, it's not a whole lot different. It's, it's more, it's just speed. You know, a TIG weld takes so much longer because they're sitting there just pulsing every puddle with a MIG. You're just hitting the button and going. Right. And obviously there's some talent to that too, but um, yeah, huge, huge difference between the processes. And then on top of that, you know, we've, we cut, well, we cut our welding down. So like per square inch, you'd say by almost 52%, I believe it was. So there's, there's way less passes across every part where the, the premium line is, is, oh, what is that? I think it's, it, it was like half the pieces, you know, right. to assemble it, it, it's half the pieces as well. So a lot less bins, a lot it's just a lot more simple. And it's that's basic. the thing that people don't understand about welding. If you're not familiar with the, the manufacturing world, like if you add a square piece inside of a, a reinforcement area, not only are you adding just one more piece to deal with, you're adding four more pathways that someone has to sit and weld and process and clean and, and grind and all, all that stuff. Uh, and so every piece impacts it dramatically on the time frame to, you know, to cut out the parts on the machining, uh, to, to clean them, to prep them, to install them, to tack them, to then weld them. Like there's a, there's a lin- there's more than linear. It's exponentially more time every time you get a, a new part or new, another piece or another component or another spot to weld. And, uh, that's why, you know, a lot of these things cost so much. It's just how much man hours are involved in making these products. It's not a robot, you know, sourcing parts from a bin and then putting them together and then automatically welding them. It's, there's a lot of human hours involved in, in these types of products. Exactly. We actually tried a robot a few years ago and we could not get it to produce what our guys do. So we, we scratched it. Wait, you mean a human can, can outperform a robot? <laughs> In this situation, yes. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is uh, go to trade school, kids. Uh, you have, you yeah. have a future. Um, yeah. So, you know, when we're looking at these new products, I mean, you said you have the X3 kit out. What What's the future look like on that product set and then just your product set in general and maybe just yeah, the company's so- focus in this year? Sure, sure. So, so obviously, uh, we're working on building the sport line and we want to build it fast. Um, our next model will be the Turbo S because that is the next popular model that we see. I, it'll be, I don't think it'll do as well as the X3 because the Turbo S arms, you know, they're a little bit more beefy than most, but these still are going to be a fully boxed 
uh, a lot stronger option. And then from there, we'll move to the Pro XP. I plan on for sure doing an OM replacement and we'll do a plus forward arm on that one to help the, the bigger tire because we have an OEM kit to put through our premium line, but we did not push it forward. And I think we kind of shot ourselves in the foot by not doing that to allow the bigger tires on, on that model. The bigger tires are really becoming more of a common thing. And I know that like on our car, we went up from, you know, the, the stock sizes up to the 32, a true 32, uh, yep. where it measures that. Um, and it does start to rub, you know, when it fully compressed and when you're turning and things like that. Um, and so, but our goal is to eventually get onto 35s because we want that rolling uh, circumference. We want to have sure. um, some of the benefits that come with that uh, increased ground clearance and things like that. So, um, you know, you're talking exactly to how the industry is trending, right? Bigger tires are becoming more common, the tensors and, and all the different options that are, are out there now. And um, people need to understand that, you know, that's one of the, you know, go into any Facebook group. I think, I think Ian has a automated filter to just ban people from his existence <laughs> if they ask you how big of a tire they can put on their car. Um, right. But uh, that's pretty much the the top three common questions in the Facebook groups, right, is how big of a tire. And I think the most common answer responding to that is, here we go again, and then, you know, talk about suspension first. Well, basically what happens is you have an owner's manual that's about two inches thick, and guys read about two centimeters worth of that two inches before they go to Facebook and start asking <laughs> questions. Yeah, I'd be surprised if they even open them at this point. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I don't even know why they come with the cars now. Hey, you know what? Yeah. Mine's never been open. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, like, I, like so yeah, from, no, no, no. Yeah. So what are you looking forward to this year as far as products yeah, and, from, and the company from there? That's, that's, uh, you know, we're, we're really going to push hard in getting those kits available. And, and also on that lineup, you know, with, with the production sped up and everything else, we're really focusing on having this stuff in stock. You know, our, our lead times on our premium kits are almost unfortunately like 10 weeks out right now. And we, we are doing everything we can to, to shorten that up. But fortunately, you know, we're, it's, the demand is high and, and we're going to keep pushing. But the sport line, we really wanted to have it be a, a very um, available product. So that's that's going to be our, our big focus there. As far as HCR, the premium brand goes itself, uh, we're just finishing up with the Polaris Ranger long travel of all things. Nice. We've, we've has, hesitated on doing it for so long, but, you know, with it being one of the best-selling units Makes and, sense. Uh, you know, getting into that world... So we're just finishing up with it. It's it's going to be a full 72 inch wide kit, and it is going to come with Kings 2.5 Kings. It's oh, the, the big daddy. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I legitimately, uh, you know, the Ranger, the Ranger, and the General and the Commanders, for what we do with, with these multi days, they're the slam dunk car to go to if you want to pack in some gear and, and do it efficiently where it's not where, where, you, where you don't have to overthink things like on my x3 like on my x3 you're just not going to be able to take the massage table you know right. you're not going to be right. able to take probably about a third of the gear you would like to and uh I, I know for a fact that a stock general, that a stock ranger would have tackled that Idaho run that we went on. No but you can't throw it into things as aggressively as you could an X3, yeah. you know, and you're about to change that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We're super stoked. We've, we're pretty much done with all the testing. We haven't released it yet. We're pretty much done with all the testing and everything else. And I've got some six inch portals actually coming from High Lifter. We're going to try out their dual Dual, dual idler portals and we're going to throw some, like, 45 inch tires and go to the mud nationals <laughs> here in a month. I was just talking to them on the podcast yesterday about, about that product. So uh, it'll be interesting to see that in, in practice. And I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Cause I mean, some of your cars, I mean, get out. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're, it's so unreal what's happening. Like I had a buddy uh, from Yakima that had 35s on his, on his XP 1000 four seater. And everybody's like, how, how do you not blow belts every five seconds? Right. How, well, what's going on with the clutching on that? 35s are very common now when you go to yep. a show you're gonna see a ton of cars on them yeah and you guys i mean shoot your uh what's the big silver one that has on like 40 somethings so i had a i had a def, uh can-am defender the the unlimited so the cat right. model and we did six inch super atv act or portals on it but it was not long travel there's just oem suspensions it was it was a big school bus but it was fun yeah it was you know got a lot of attention and that was our fun you know it's fun to go get lunch in and just cruise around town. But yeah, I was on 39s. And then we also have a Flourish General, 
And that was kind of the one we, we messed around with first. We did six inch portals on it and 42 inch BFG crawlers. So, you know, me coming from the Jeep world, it's kind of fun to, to mix my, my experience there into these side by sides. And, and the fun part about it guys is we've actually used these things. I've had that. We've seen you out on the rocks. Oh yeah. Yeah. We've taken, you know, taken all over and I've, I've only broken one portal, but it's, it's been quite amazing to, you know, just push the limits on what we're, what things are capable of and, and just stepping outside of the box, getting out to Arkansas is going to be an eye opener. I'm sure for me, cause I've, I've never experienced that side of the world and, and, uh, looking forward to it. Are you, go- are you going to a park? basically like the mud, the, nationals? the mud nationals I love the mud nationals, yeah. so i assume you know the guys from monsters of the south we kind of cross paths at some of the shows yeah, yeah i actually yeah. threw it out there to the to the main dude uh brannon that uh, i wanted to go do an overland trip through the ozarks in 2022 oh dang yeah yeah, yeah when you, when you said arkansas i'm like hmm <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've never experienced that mud stuff so it'll be an eye-opener for watch sure. those snakes <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah the uh as far as you know this last year um kind of what what was your perspective on this crazy last year and how is it impacting what you guys are doing going forward i know you talked a little bit about availability and high demand you know what's the transition look like for you guys going from covid year to looking forward to kind of opening back up and and being more uh, active so uh, yeah it's been a wild year so you know this time last year we were all preparing for things to slow down and take a dive. And, uh, you know, we were doing okay. I think we were like three, four week lead times at this point last year, which was really pretty good. You know, we, we were, we'd strive to be a, a two week lead time, but, uh, after COVID hit and we, people realized how bad they just wanted to be outside. Our, our sales just went through the roof and, and it has never stopped since last year. And the, the fun part about, the way things are right now in my mind, and I keep thinking it was going to drop off, but it, it, there's no sign of it in my eyes right now. We went out and did a ride with UTV Utah and Slick Rock Productions of, uh, a month or two ago. And we had, I think, about 100 or so cars go do double Sammy. So that's a very short trail to put 100 cars on. It looks like a pretty but, good turnout there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, uh, they asked the question at first, how many people has done that trail? And I was thinking, you know, everyone here's done that trail. It's that's the most popular trail. 75% of those people had not even done it. And so that right there just told me how many new people we're still getting. And this is just in Utah. You know what I mean? Right. There's, there's so many people that are new and so uneducated and, and just, it, it kind of makes it fun still to me because, you know, you're getting to, it, it's kind of like there's a whole new run of, of people and customers that have no idea what they're doing or what they're buying. And, and, you know, it makes us stay on our toes and not just expect that everybody knows who we are. I think that's a huge uh, change in, in the shift in the shifting sand of the community is that, you know, we're getting a lot of new people and there a lot of the people are that have been in the community have never taken risks. And, and, you know, you're talking about rock crawling. That's a huge part of that, right? Is risk. How much mm-hmm. are you going to weigh the risk versus the reward of claiming it? Um, I think there's a huge ascending market for the guiding stuff where you can take an experienced person and a group of, of newcomers or a, a people that haven't chosen to take that risk yet and to get out and try new things. And that try new things part of it, I think is what's driving that overlanding growth that we're seeing in kind of the stuff that we do where it's like, okay, yeah these cars are capable of a lot, but I've never really applied it to what I want to do, which is get out and explore and, and camp and, and all these things. And so this market's just extending into this new era of, I want to try something. And, yep. um, you know, that's really going to drive, I think some of the products and companies and the development and the investments that these companies are doing into the idea that you can get out, you can do more. And this is the way you can do it in a confident manner. And that, would for me if I was to take a brand new general razor razor ranger whatever into the the backlands of of some state to go spend a week I would want to make sure my suspension is not going to break I want want to make sure my right. ball joints don't break I want to make sure that none of that's a problem and the only thing I have to worry about is making sure there's gas in the car yeah well and that's such a huge part too is is how that's the only thing that bums me out I will say honestly about the market right now is how uneducated people are. The fact that you can go sign your name and buy a 200 horsepower car right out of the box and have no idea what you're doing 
other than watching YouTube videos. And I want to go try that. You right. know, it's that something's got to change there in my opinion. Cause it's, it's getting pretty ugly as far as that ed- of things go, but there's definitely, you know, some education on etiquette and the way you handle yourself into these like communities that allow you to ride on the roads. You know, we yep. we're seeing a direct impact in Moab, <clears throat> excuse me, Moab exactly. in, in Utah. And, um, in a lot of areas, like in the Northwest, there's a lot of small communities that are starting to open their doors up to UTVs because they see the impact that it has on their communities. It, it brings in a lot of tourism dollars. And right. uh, there's cities like, you know, when we go to when we have takeover in Oklahoma, you know, that that city basically is a, a one stop light type town where it, like you don't really have any reason to stop. And when a big event can bring in 10,000 people, that's a huge impact for that community and that state. Sure. Um, and so we as a community need to be better at communicating to those new people, not being jerks about it, not being rude about how, you know, they're treating our lands and everything else, but just educate them. Hey, just so next time you are, you're aware, let's try to keep this under control. Let's clean up the trail. Let's not leave our, if we roll the car down the rock, let's not leave our beers all over the floor. Right. Um, right. You know, that kind of stuff. And, and then being proactive on the community, like stand up for what our rights are, stand up for it when people are trying to shut us down. It, it's honestly gotten to a point where we got to go above and beyond, you know, exactly. pretty much each individual rider, each individual enthusiast has got to, got to be cognizant of that, you know, and, and watch, watch out for the bad apples and right. just kind of yeah. nullify the damage that they're doing. And, and also just even on the financial side, there's a lot more people throwing money around nowadays, right? And they're getting these cars, 200 horsepower, like you're saying, then going straight to the dunes and then yard selling it within 30 minutes. Like it's, it's not only the education on how they're riding, how they're supposed to ride, uh, how to handle the cars, getting familiar with their cars. But I mean, that kind of um, lack of, of respect for what they're actually investing in it has a direct impact into like insurance rates and and the, the, the regulations on these cars and, and all of that. So if we're all cognizant of the impact that we make when we go and try something harder or more difficult or just send it or try to one up their buddy or whatever, um, you know, maybe possibly that can that change that can impact change to where in the future we're still doing this ten years from now with the freedoms or more freedoms than we have versus being regulated down to parks. Yeah, exactly. That was a cool thing about having UTV takeover out to San Hollow last year. Is I was honestly quite concerned, you know, watching our backyard get more or less pummeled by that many people at once. And I was really impressed on how well they cleaned up and you know, took care of the land after it was all said and done. That was, that was pretty cool. Honestly, I think it's going to keep happening. Um, there's a mass exodus out of California right now. Utah is a target. Arizona is a target. Colorado, honestly, for whatever reason, Washington is too. Washington and Idaho. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I gotta say, man, UTV is slowly, but surely like the, almost like the, the capital of, development and innovation in UTV is slowly but surely moving towards Utah. I mean, there's some yeah, serious, serious companies <laughs> working out of there. Utah for sure. <laughs> what's it, what's it like being in an environment over there where you have the ultimate terrain to test in and to ride. And then some of these big companies really investing in the area. Uh, you know, we really don't see a whole lot of it other than, you know, we're just very fortunate, I guess is what it boils down to. There's, there's certainly, uh, disadvantage to being where we're at because we are limited on resources. You know, Southern right. Utah is not a, a huge city. And, you know, we've got St. George, which is a little bit bigger. And, you know, then we've got Vegas about two and a half hours uh, south of us. But, you know, we are limited on resources up here. And But the the plus side is, is having the, you know, we can drive literally five minutes and unload to protest purposes and, and to go have fun. We've got a 10,000 foot mountain right out of town that we can ride our UTV from the shop. So, you know, the, if you're an outdoorsman and like, uh, you know, motorsports, outdoor sports, whatever it may be, that it does not get better than here. Do you guys have a hard time finding skilled labor to be in the shop? Is that something that you battle? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's, is, is one of our biggest battles. Fortunately, we've got a, a local tech school that has a welding, uh, class and we, we pull them right out of there most of the time. We've had really good luck with that. Great. So you work with the colleges to kind of yep. bring people in and out and introduce them to the work environment and, and what the expectations of that will be? Yeah, exactly. And the funny thing is, is we'll have guys that have been welding for 20 years. And, you know, our, before we even interview anybody, we'll just tell them to bring their hood and lay down a bead. 
and they can they they can be a certified welder in every way, but they haven't done what we've done. And right. a lot of those, a lot of those guys that's been doing it forever actually don't end up doing very well because they've trained their mind to do it differently. Bad habits. So these, these young kids right out of school are learning our process right out of the gate and man, they catch on quick and it's been really awesome. We we're very fortunate to have such a, a good, good crew right now. So, uh, kind of just to kind of wrap things up, um, what, what's the biggest thing you're looking forward to this year? Uh, you know, hopefully getting caught up. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> I think that's just big... universally every business's like goal this yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, hopefully get caught up. Uh, some of the I, I forgot to mention some of the new projects we'll be working on, and I tried not to push it too hard, but we are going to do a, a launch travel kit for the new commander. I hope oh, nice it here in a few weeks and get going on it. And then obviously the anticipated pro R. I you know ex- excited to get our hands on that and do our thing with it and. And, uh, and just knocking out this sport line. So I, I just want to make a point that, uh, we're going to not say that that's an official launch yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I actually asked a guy earlier, uh, earlier this week, kind of what he knew because they're kind of affiliated with Polaris. And, uh, he was talking about getting his hands on a pro R. And so I just flat out said, any, any news on when that thing's coming? He was like, dude, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. And, and I'm excited uh, to on the new rumors of the X3 replacement, you know, what that's going to look like. So I can't wait for kind of how this industry is going to for, form over the next year. You know, we're going to see a lot of potential and a lot of new growth on, on the platforms. Uh, I, I think once people start seeing the speed car out there as well, that uh, yeah. Can-Am and Polaris can be like, hmm. For sure. <laughs> Back when the Turbo S came out, honestly, when I saw those arms and I, you know, we pulled them off and picked them up, I'm like, this may be the end of HCR because these actually feel feel pretty strong but the the fun part after that g- happened and you know it doesn't matter how much effort or time or whatever people put into something we can always make it better because they have to make it affordable and you know there's always going to be the guy that has that that doesn't have to have it be as affordable and and want strength and and I got that out of my head pretty quick. You know, when you take the pro R and these different machines coming out and they're going to have this amazing suspension already, there's still a little tubed arm that will fail when you hit a hole. So it's all, it's always there's still be a, a spreadsheet that has a ratio of profit margin built in exactly. that they have to meet and, and they're never ever going to be at the quality level of an aftermarket upgrade. Well, I think if you're right, an, right. if you're a, uh, if you're Polaris, you'd rather have an A arm fail than something Absolutely. greater. <laughs> And that's like, sure. they they design that in. That's like part of the process. Like if we're gonna have something fail, what's the first thing that's gonna fail? And they'll they'll never tell you what that is, but they're but that's part of the engineering process. So um, yeah, looking forward to seeing these products come out. Looking forward to possibly getting um, some new equipment on some new cars this year and seeing how they handle and um, kind of the differences they make. Looking forward to uh, not having two inch shocks on a Pro XP4 with upgraded <laughs> suspension. Um, but two two, two, two point on a <laughs> twenty four hundred pound car. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure we can cook breakfast on that next year. Probably. Uh, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was excited to, to have you on the show and, and let you tell your story and, and look forward to just kind of, I mean, shoot, you're working with a lot of really great brands this year, including like Al Macbeth and, and yep. all that. I mean, that, that's all just, he's someone that's going to push it to the edge, right? He's going to find the Absolutely. limitations. And if he can, if he can vouch for a product in that aspect, I mean, that's, that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Well, and that's, that's what's such fun about having guys like Al and, and, you know, some of the, these best drivers in the world, is if they find a way to break it, we're going, you know, obviously at some point everything's going to break, but if, if there's something we can improve on, we will. And the, the best part about that is, is the guy across the street is going to have the same arm that Al McBeth does. You know, we're not going to just make a special thing for him to help, help drive our brand. It's, it's going to be, you're not you're, putting you're any secret with, sauce into his product. It's exactly, it's really the honest exactly. truth of the product being at that level. Yep, exactly. So um, yeah, where can we find you and your company HDR online? Where can we follow you guys and look at your products? Yeah, just HDR Racing on Instagram and Facebook, and HDRRacing.com on the web. And then you uh, have some other brands like you mentioned, HCT Voodoo Recovery, yep, yep, so and I H- actually H- have Voodoo stuff in my car. So oh, cool, cool. So yeah, HCT Power Sports and. And for real, guys, check that out. That out. It's got a lot of really good brands going into it, and 
a lot of exciting things to come for it as well. And then obviously Voodoo Off-Road, we're going to have all kinds of fun new stuff coming out for that uh, as far as recovery gear and uh, a few other surprises coming too. So Rad, lots well, of fun stuff happening. Look forward to it. Keep us in the loop. And uh, we'll be pushing out more content this season with uh, the brands and everybody on the, on the tour of TakeOver and all the other events that are going on. Uh, so look forward to that. You can find us on all the podcast streaming platforms, the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast, Facebook, Side by Side Guys, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, uh, all the things that Ian doesn't do. And uh, we will... Uh, Tin- Tinder, Grinder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, until the next time, guys, peace. Peace.